Morning, all. Uh, today, let's remember the prayer of the month, which is our children and youth as they go back to school. Also be in prayer for the future growth here at Central in those grades. Thank you to all the women who came out yesterday for the murder mystery. Uh, we heard they had a great time. Pictures will be coming soon. This week is also JAMA. If you normally work this and cannot, please let John know. Uh, this coming Tuesday is our monthly elders meeting at Summer Summit Leadership. That's at 4.30. That is an open meeting, and all are welcome. Also, August 28th will be our elder election. If you know you'll be out of town, please contact the church office for a ballot if you wish to vote. Next Sunday, there will be a children's ministry meeting after services. If you're a part of the children's ministry, please plan on staying. If you have been thinking about helping in the children's ministry, you are welcome to come to this meeting as well. Remember, the item of the month for JAMA is spaghetti sauce, just not in a glass jar. Let's go to God for a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've given us today. Thank you for the beautiful day we're having. Please be with Bob as he delivers your message today. Protect us on our way home. Protect us in the following week. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So good morning, everyone. Let's stand and let's sing in this key. <laughs> let's sing at Calvary. Years of spinning and many and by Caring not my Lord was crucified Knowing not it was for me He died for Calvary Mercy there was great and grace was free Pardon there was love implied to me There my burning soul found liberty Oh, 
morning of the sunshine. God, we pray that you will be with us as we continue to worship. Thank you so much for the words to this song. That we'll be able to walk inside you one day and we can have hope in them. Thank you so much for your love. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. It would be time for children's worship. If you watch that video that was just played, you will know that that's what the church is supposed to be. We're supposed to be a community, and the goal for Central Christian Church is that we will be a community of believers, and that as such, we're not just people that show up at a building on Sunday morning for a few hours and then go home and never see each other ever again. We are family, and I hope we're developing into that as time goes by. Probably one of the hardest things Christian people have to do today is make time to be with other Christian people. Every one of us are busy. Every one of us have a million things to do. And we can be busy from the time we wake up on Monday morning until the time we go to bed Saturday night and get so caught up in what's going on in this world that we struggle to have the kind of community that God wants us to have. And I am so thankful that here at Central Christian Church we're working toward being the community God wants us to be. We've got Bible studies to attend almost every day of the week. Excuse me when I... For some reason, my throat decided to act up right at this very moment. We've got Bible studies almost every day of the week. We've got small groups you can go to. We've got things going on in our church that allow us to see each other during the week if you will simply take advantage of that. And if you can't get out and get there, most of the things we do... The Bible studies, at least, are online. And if you're at home because you don't feel well or you just can't get out for some reason, go online and watch. You can watch it live or you can watch it later on. But we're doing what we think is best for our congregation here to try to build that kind of a community. You know, I love that last song, Daniel. Christ is mine forevermore. Isn't that an awesome thought? We belong to Jesus Christ, and if we will accept him as our Savior and join him in his kingdom, we can be with him forevermore, and one day we will walk the streets and we'll walk side by side with Jesus. I don't even get an amen out of that. <laughs> you know, that, <clears throat> that doesn't thrill us, and someday we're going to leave this world, and we're going to walk into heaven, and we're going to be up there with him forever. Just the idea of that should make us want to enjoy each other more here on earth. Because we're going to spend eternity together 
with him and with each other as we hang with him. Last week, we we're going to start a study. <coughs> I apologize for my voice. I don't know what's going on here. John may have to get up here and finish this lesson. <laughs> Last week, we were going to start a study on this handout, and hopefully you've got one and you've looked over it. We emailed them out as well if you didn't want to print one off. We're going to go through this over the next couple of, maybe even three weeks, and we're going to talk about who is Central Christian Church. Who are we? We're not going to go page by page necessarily, line by line. You can read this thing at home. And I've encouraged you, if you read it and you find something in there that you're not sure of, something that you question, something that you'd like explained better, somebody go get me a glass of water, please. Water Thank you. I don't know what's going on up here with this voice of mine. Thank you, Mary Lou. Let's try the water first. Thank you. Strong. I'll blame Daniel. And I blame Daniel. Thank you. That helped a lot. Thank you very much. I blame Daniel because he picked such good songs that I was singing out, singing those songs because the words were so beautiful. And as we sing, I hope you listen to the words, you know, those, especially those last two songs that we sang this morning. Had a lot of meaning behind them. Had a lot of thought put into the words, and as we sang those words, I hope you were imagining what a wonderful name it is. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. We can overcome anything that comes our way knowing that our God is with us. Knowing that we're not fighting this stuff by ourselves, we have a God who's arm in arm with us, who's given us his Holy Spirit, who enables us to get through the trials in this life. And one of the lines in one of those songs was, harm was going to come our way. When we walk with Jesus, we're going to struggle at times. Things are not always going to be easy. Don't listen to those people who would preach, as long as you've got Christ, you're going to have an easy life. As long as you're a Christian, you get everything you want. As long as you're a Christian, everything works out for you just perfectly. That is not what Jesus says if you're thinking about stuff in this world. If you're thinking about physical things, the Bible never says Christians will have an easy life. To the contrary, Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. That's the goal for us, is to realize we have a God who will be with us no matter what. But we're going to look at this little handout. We're going to talk about Central Christian Church, and we're going to try to explain who are we and what do we do. The, the primary goal for this is for new people, as they will be coming in, we will give this to them and talk to them about it. But we thought, the elders thought, probably would do good for us to just go through it together here on Sunday morning. So that's what we're going to be doing. Central Christian Church is part of a group that's called many different things, but primarily it's called part of the Restoration Movement. We used to be called the Stone Campbell people. And way back long ago, Churches of Christ and Christian churches were called Campbellites because of Alexander Campbell being one of the main guys who got this thing rolling. And sort of a derision was they just called people who belonged to the groups that we belong to Campbell lights, and so we're going to talk about some of that and how we got to be who we are in just a real short history lesson for you. And some of you I know just really love history, right, Julie? And you're just thrilled to know we're going to talk about history and we're going to go through what's happened before. But I think it's important for us when people ask you, well, what denomination is Simple Christian Church? That's a typical question. Protestant churches belong to denominations for the most part. They belong to some kind of group. And so a lot of times you'll get that question, well, what kind of church is Central Christian Church? You need to know a little bit of the history of how we got to be who we are. And so we're going to talk about that real quick. This next 10 minutes or five minutes or so is covered in a couple of semesters at seminary. They really go into it. You can learn all kinds of stuff. And if you want to know more about this after today, come talk to me. I've taken a lot of restoration movement classes, and I'll be happy to try to explain some things to you if you'd like to know. This group started primarily here in the United States of America. 
right around this area where you and I live today. Back in the late 1700s and early 1800s, there were at least five different groups of people who were starting their own path, if you want to call it that. They were people in different denominations who had decided God doesn't want Christianity divided into all these sects. Instead, God's desire is that we would be united and be one group of Christian people who could get along with each other. We studied this. Bob led us in this lesson last Sunday morning. We studied John chapter 17. Jesus' primary prayer when he was about to go to the cross before he left this world was that we today would be one people, that we would be united with each other the way Jesus Christ is united with God the Father. We have never managed to get there. I doubt that we will ever manage to get there because humanity likes to mess things up, it seems like, and we start thinking our own way and doing our own thing, and, and before you know it, we're split, and that's exactly what happened. You can see that happening even in the Scripture. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul comes in, and he's talking to the group at Corinth, and he says, I'm amazed at you people. You're already divided. Some of you say, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul, I follow this guy. And the church is already divided based upon who taught them and who baptized them. Division was already starting. It's gotten worse and worse and worse. Until today, there's probably some 2,000 different recognizable groups of Christians, most of whom believe they're the only ones that have it right. This group doesn't like that group. That group doesn't like this group. We fight and squabble, and it's no wonder that the world looks at Christianity today and says, you people can't even get along with each other. Why would I want to be a part of your group? I can stay home and fight my wife. I don't need to go to some church building and fight a bunch of people, right? So the church was divided horribly in the late 1700s here in America, and I think part of it was because America was being defined as a land of freedom a land where we could have some ability to remove some control of us. And if you know much about American history, many people came to the New World trying to avoid what was going on in Europe. They wanted to get away from the king. They wanted to get away from the queen. They wanted to get away from the hierarchy that was telling everybody how to live. And that was just as true politically as it was religiously. And if you study church history, you know some churches murdered people who belonged to other groups. They were so angry that you didn't agree with them that they killed each other. They had wars against each other, Protestants versus Catholics, Protestants versus other Protestants, because they demanded that you either saw it their way or it was the highway. There wasn't any room for compromise. There wasn't any room for trying to work things out. They just decided, we're it and you're not. And they brought some of those thoughts over to America. And as this nation started to grow and we got into the late 1700s and early 1800s, some people started realizing that is not the way God's church was supposed to act. We don't need to be divided. We shouldn't be fighting each other. It shouldn't be one church on each corner and neither one of those groups ever getting along with each other. And so several groups unbeknownst to the others at first, started trying to move their congregations back to what they believed the New Testament church taught. One group was led by a man named James O'Kelly. In 1794, up in Virginia, he was a Methodist preacher, and as he studied the Bible, he realized there isn't anything in the Bible that talks about some organizational structure that tells everybody what to do. Many denominations today have a group headquarters that basically tells everybody, every other church in their group, this is what you're going to believe. This is what you're supposed to do. Many of them even have a lectionary, nothing wrong with those, but they preach the same thing every Sunday because they follow that lectionary and that's the way they do it. And some churches are stronger than others in this area some less, but Mr. O'Kelly thought, you know, we need to get away from this organism, man-made organizational stuff and try to do it the way the Bible does it. And we looked this morning at Acts chapter 2, and if you're wondering what did the early church look like, you need to read the book of Acts. 
because that's the beginning of the church and the next probably 20, 25 years of the church. And it talks about how it developed, how it got started, how they acted, what they did. And it's a good place for you to go if you want to learn what was the early church like. So James O'Kelly thought, I don't want to be Methodist. I just want to be a Christian. And so they started calling themselves Christians. About the same time in 1801, Abner Jones, who was a Baptist preacher up in Vermont and New Hampshire, he made the circuit preaching, came up with some of the same ideas. And his thought was, I don't want to be Baptist. I just want to be a Christian. I just want to do it the way the church look like it did it in the New Testament time. And so he has a group going on up in the Northeast America while James O'Kelly is trying to do it in Virginia. And about the same time, this guy named Elias Smith lived in Connecticut. He's another Baptist. He started thinking in about 1812, he and Abner decided they were going to join their groups. And so they pulled together and they start developing these congregations of people who are not Baptist, instead they're calling themselves simply Christian people. Trying to pull out of these man-made organizations, trying to simply be the church God wants us to be. About that same time, well, that was going on back in the East, out here in our part of the country, especially in southern Kentucky, a guy by the name of Barton Stone, who was a Presbyterian preacher, who showed up at Cane Ridge. How many of you have been to Cane Ridge and seen the building up at Cane Ridge? I'd recommend go up to southern Kentucky and look at Cane Ridge. The building that Barton Stone preached in is still there. It's built under now. They, they put, erected a building over it to protect it. But Barton Stone was a Presbyterian preacher who listened to some of these early speakers and decided, that sounds good to me. And so he developed and started calling his group and took his whole Presbyterian congregation and they all left the Presbyterian church and said, we're simply going to call ourselves Christians. We're going to be the Christian church because we don't want to be Presbyterian. We don't want to be Baptist. We don't want to be Methodist. We don't want to be Catholic. We just want to be Christian people. And so he goes into Cane Ridge while they're having this huge revival. And if you've never read the story of Cane Ridge, I encourage you, go Google it. Read about it. Over the space of about three weeks or so, some 25,000 people showed up at Cane Ridge. Cane Ridge at that time, still is, was simply a field with a building in it. And these people came and camped out and camped out, and there were scores of preachers, and they'd have little clumps of people all over the place. This guy would be preaching, that guy would be preaching, and they just kept coming and kept coming, and they would come and stay for a week or two and leave, and other people would come, and a huge spiritual revival broke out in Western United States. Western United States then, all right? Not Western United States today. It was Kentucky. But a huge Christian revival broke out and that group that Barton Stone was part of started growing like crazy, almost like what we read in Acts chapter two today. People were coming to Christ daily and becoming simply Christian people, not tied to some denomination not tied to some man-made organizational structure, but simply wanting to be New Testament Christian people. About that same time, a father and son by the name of Alexander and Thomas Campbell, who had come over from Scotland, they had started out Presbyterian as well. They moved out of the Presbyterian church as they started teaching these things. The church said, get out, we don't want you here. So they went to a Baptist church, started preaching what they were preaching in the Baptist church, until finally they decided we can't be Baptist either. And so they wrote their own charter, basically a letter that said, we believe that God's church shouldn't be controlled by men. Not by some man-made structure with man-made rules because that's not what God wants us to be. And so they came up with a group called the Disciples of Christ. Some of you have been in churches called Disciples of Christ. Same general group until about 1832, I think it was, Stone and the Campbells got to meet each other and decided they were going to pull their churches together and they became disciples of Christ slash Christian churches. And at that time, for probably the next 50 years in America at least, it was the fastest growing group of churches in the nation. And their whole idea was, we just want to do what the Bible says. We don't want to make up a bunch of extra rules. We don't want somebody in... Scotland telling us what to think. We don't want somebody in New York City telling us what we have to preach. 
We just want people to be able to come together based on the Bible and study and teach what the Bible says. And their churches started growing like crazy. <clears throat> Sadly, because we're all human, it didn't last very long. Their ideal was fabulous. Let's just be first century Christian people. Let's just take the Bible as our guide and do it. Civil War came. This is a freebie. I don't have a slide for this one. Civil War came, and, and a lot of Christian churches, disciples of Christ churches in the north, aligned with the northern mindset, naturally. A lot of disciples of Christ Christian churches in the south aligned with the southern mindset, naturally. And so when the war was over, we've got this country that's still divided horribly, as are some churches. And so the churches of Christ, what you and I know as the churches of Christ a cappella today, decided they were going to break off of the disciples of Christ group. They didn't want to be part of that group because they're Yankees and they're doing nasty things and we're Southerners and we don't want to be part of them. So the ideal that Stone and Campbell and all these guys had didn't last very long. And so through the South, the group that was the Disciples of Christ Christian churches primarily became Churches of Christ. And the Disciples of Christ Christian churches primarily stayed up North. As time has gone by, obviously, they've moved back and forth, and you can find all of those in either group. Until about 1958 or so, there were those two primarily groups. Acapella Churches of Christ, Disciples of Christ slash Christian Churches. In about the late 1950s, we go almost 100 years maintaining that status quo. A lot of people in the Disciples of Christ Christian Church group started thinking some people in our group are getting too liberal. That's a horrible word, isn't it, to most Christian people, that word liberal? But many people started thinking they wanted to just expand what they believed and accept everybody and everybody's faith, and some people couldn't accept that. So late 1950s, early 1960s, the disciples of Christ split off from the Christian churches. And so you've got disciples of Christ, one recognized group, Christian churches like we are, another recognized group, and acapella churches of Christ, another recognized group. So the ideal that Stone, Campbell, O'Keefe, Abner Jones, those guys came up with was wonderful, but it didn't work very long. Because just like in the book of Corinthians, within a few years of Acts chapter 2, churches started split, people started arguing, people didn't get along with each other, that group didn't like this group, and here we are today, once again, divided like crazy. But the ideal was real. Let's just be Christians. And I'm not saying if you're visiting with us, or even if you've been here in our church for a while, I'm not at all suggesting that Christian church are the only ones that have it right. Please don't think I'm saying that. There are Christians, I believe, in practically every denomination out there. But I do believe the way we practice what we do here at Central Christian Church comes pretty close to how we can imagine the church what they believed way back in Acts chapter 2 and through the book of Acts. I will say this, and maybe Sunday we'll have a series on this as well. What we do on Sunday morning has nothing to do with what the early church did in Acts. I have no doubt. First of all, because they didn't have any church buildings. right? They were being persecuted. They were being attacked not only by the Jews, but later on by the Romans. You couldn't build a building like this and everybody come together because you just became a sitting duck for the people who were looking to, to persecute you. So there were no church buildings in the Bible. No Christian church buildings. People met in homes. People met by the river. People met wherever they wanted to. But nobody was building buildings. And so people didn't do church like this where I stand up front. Everybody else sits there on the pew. Nobody's talking to each other. I get more of the idea, if you read through Corinthians especially, the early church came together and they talked with each other. What an idea. <laughs> Can you imagine going to a church service and instead of doing what we do here on Sunday morning, we do more like what we do back here in Bible class. 
we sit around and we share the word and somebody, in fact, Corinthians says, some has a, one has a song, one has a prayer, one has a statement. And you would sit and we, would, we wouldn't have a paid worship leader and I'm thankful for Daniel. But if you wanted to sing a song, you sing a song. If you wanted to lead a song, you led a song. If you wanted to share some insight in scripture, you shared some insight in scripture. And we were more of a small group kind of setting, coming together, getting to know each other, working together, because that's the way the church started. We are what we are today. Close your ears if you don't want to hear this. We are what we are today because of the Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic Church came along in the late 300s, early 400s, took all the power that Rome would give them and took over Christianity for the most part. They were the boss. They told you what to believe. They told you how to act. And if you didn't do it their way, they excommunicated you. And for about 500 years, Roman Catholic Church ruled Christianity, built those beautiful cathedrals, did all kinds of stuff, set worship up the way you and I do it. Their priest told you what to believe. If you didn't like it, you could leave. And if you didn't leave, sadly, many times they killed you. And that's just the way Christianity was, not just the Roman Catholics. A lot of denominations did that. A lot of Protestants were doing that as well. But the way we do church today comes out of the Roman Catholic Church. They set it up, this is the way it goes, and that's what we do, and we've done it this way for 1,500 years now or more. Nothing wrong with it. Don't misunderstand me. I don't think what we're doing is wrong. It's not sinful. We shouldn't stop doing it. I'm just not sure this is the way the first century church did church. So if we're really ever going to try to pull ourselves back to what the first century church is, we're going to have to change the way we do things. And we can talk about that, and we can play with that, and, and see what we want to do. But the idea that Stone and Campbell and some of the others had was, we don't want any man-made hierarchy. We want each congregation to be able to rule themselves so that the church in Lexington, Kentucky, can't write to the church in Jonesboro and say, you guys got to believe this. And we can't write to the church in Bristol and say, you got to believe that. And if you don't do what we tell you, we're going to have a horrible situation. Every congregation was able to study the Bible, rule themselves the way the early church appeared to do that. Paul, if you read through the book of Acts, as he went through his missionary journeys and would establish churches, they would go back through and appoint elders in the cities in which they had planted these churches, which is another situation. At that time, there was only one church, okay? And so you didn't have the church on Maple and Fifth and the church on you know, 11E and the church on somewhere else. They had one church in Jonesboro, and they had elders over that city, and those elders ruled over those churches in the sense that they were the spiritual oversight to help people in that community grow. Through time and through the way we've messed things up, we now have all these little churches, and we're not even associating with each other. But in the early church in the first century, they had elders in a community who were the spiritual shepherds for the whole city. It has evolved into we have elders in each congregation. And each congregation has its own spiritual oversight and helps each other do the things we're supposed to do. And we've got that here at Central Christian Church. We've got some real good men who are part of the eldership here at Central Christian Church. If you don't know who they are, we're going to tell you. One of them is Paul Bays. Paul is out of town today. He and Emily are down in Florida. Uh, they're supposed to be back, I believe, on Wednesday. But, what? Yeah, Yeah, I think Wednesday. So he'll be back. See him next Sunday and say, oh, you're one of the elders. Don't tell him we said this. Just go up to him next Sunday and say, oh, you're one of the elders. And just let him wonder what we're talking about. The others who are here, Bob Gibson, if you'd stand up. Notice Bob Gibson back there. He's sitting with his wife, Susan. He's one of our elders, and if you can stay standing for just a minute. Casey Gidley, sitting here with his wife, Julie. Casey's one of our elders. John Livingston's up on the stage, and Heather's down here on the floor. I'm Bob Roberson. I'm one of the elders, too. My wife, Debbie, is right there. Who am I forgetting? Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Where is Rob? I, I forget him because I can't see him. Rob is hiding, probably doing children's church. Okay, thank you. He and his wife, Lisa. Y'all can sit down. Thanks, guys. Those are the elders here at Central Christian Church, the spiritual oversight for this congregation. If you're struggling with something, 
you've got something going on in your life, you've got some question about the Bible, seek out one of the elders and ask them about it. Go study with them. Let them know you've got some issues going on in your life and you want them to help you. That's their primary role in the church. The elders are not the boss of the church. We're not the CEO. We're not the board of directors. That is not the way God designed his congregation. Sometimes we act that way, sadly, because we've sort of morphed ourselves into a business kind of entity. But in reality, the primary role the elders in a congregation have is to be the shepherds, to be the spiritual oversight of, of the congregation, to help people grow their lives to be more like Jesus. And that's what the six of us want to help you do. And if you've got some questions, you're wondering, how can I do this? What's the best way to grow? How can I develop the way God wants me to? See one of the elders. Talk to one of them. See what they can do to help move you in the direction you need to go. There are many other people in our congregation you can talk to as well. The neat thing about the way God set it up is the elders are not the sole authority here. You can go to somebody else. You can talk to Alvis. You can talk to Chi-Chi. You got a Bible question? Go talk to them. We have the freedom in Christ to study the Bible for ourselves. That's one of the major differences between some Protestant churches and some others that are much more organized, that individuals can read their own Bible, study for themselves, talk amongst themselves, learn what's going on, so that we can get along with each other and be the people God wants us to be. Again, the goal was admirable. Let's just be one. Let's just work together. It has not worked well. It has not happened well because people get involved and there's always personalities and there's always this person that gets his nose out of joint because somebody doesn't do it the way they want to. Some of you have been church long enough to know people leave a congregation because somebody picks the wrong color of carpet. I wanted blue. And they picked this gutty red, rust, whatever color this is. So I'm going somewhere else. You know, you've been there. You've seen that happen. I don't want church to start at 1030. I want it to start at 11. There's got to be some verse in the Bible that says Sunday morning worship starts at 11 o'clock. What are you people doing starting at 1030? And we all know we get over by noon, right? Now, in our congregation, it's so we can beat the Baptist to lunch, okay? In the Baptist church, it's so they can beat the Christian church to lunch. You know, in the Christian church, the Methodists want to beat the Presbyterian. We all want to get done at noon because, doggone it, there's got to be some Bible verse that says church is over at noon. That's why we start at 1030. We get an hour and a half, all right? We're almost always out by noon. But you get stuck here for a little 30 more minutes than most churches do. But the goal is to be a congregation of people, I'm going to say this and you're going to laugh, well, maybe you won't, who like each other. I mean, wouldn't that be awesome to have 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 of us in a congregation and every one of us like each other? We do. We do. We do. I think we do, Shelley. I really do. And I said it last week, I think, I, I believe at this moment in the history of Central Christian Church, we've got a bunch of people here that get along. Amen. As far as I know, there is no click or clicks in our church where this group doesn't like that group or these people won't get along with those people. I've been in churches like that. Central Christian Church was a church like that when I first got here. God has worked through this congregation. He's weeded some people out. And there are times, church, and I'll tell you this, when I was praying, when I first started preaching here in 2005, it didn't take me long to start praying, God, either change those people or get them out of here. And God got them out. There were people here who had to have it their way, and if it wasn't their way, they were going to cause trouble, and they were gossiping and griping and complaining, and there was this group didn't like that group, and those people wouldn't even sit in the same row as those people, and if you came in that door, they'd come in this door, because they did not like each other. One of our elders got a divorce. He came to the elders' board and said, I want you to tell my ex-wife she can't worship here anymore. <laughs> Can you believe that? I mean, it's bad enough he had to go through a divorce. I understand marriages don't always work. But he's an elder in this church. 
And instead of worrying about his own soul and his own situation, all he could think of is, I don't want my ex-wife in this building where I worship. My gut feeling was he wasn't worshiping. You can't have that kind of an attitude in worship. That was this church 15 years ago. God has worked through this church because of you. Because you don't do those kinds of things. You've worked through those kinds of things. Not because we don't have differences of opinion. Not because we don't always see eye to eye. We always have things we can argue about and fuss over and change and think, I don't like this, I don't like that. The neat thing is we can come together and talk about it. We can work it out. We don't have to say it's either my way or the highway. We can come together and compromise and make things work so that we can still be family even though we don't all agree on everything. That's the way God's church is supposed to act. We don't all have to see eye to eye. We don't have to agree on every single thing that happens. But what we've got to do is love each other. What we've got to do is be able to forgive and get along with each other. Because that's the way God designed his church. And if we're going to live and be the church God wants us to be, that's the way we've got to act. We've got to be forgiving people. We've got to be loving people. We've got to be compassionate people. We've got to be patient people. We've got to be people that realize Cheryl and I don't do everything alike. And it's okay that she does something differently than I do. It really is okay. Because we don't all have to do everything the same way. It's a shock for some of you maybe to think we don't all see the Bible the same way. All six of us elders don't understand every scripture in the Bible to mean exactly the same thing every one of us thinks it does. We have disagreements on that. But we're praying and we're studying and we're trying to make God or allow God to show us the way we need to believe it. But even while we're working through that, we're getting along with each other. We're working together for the good of this congregation. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to be family. He wants us to be the kind of people that when people come and visit with us, they can feel that, you know, those people seem to like each other. What a shock that is. You know, those people seem to like to get along. Those people seem to enjoy being together. And when we end this service here in a little bit, we're only going to give out half our sermon today, John. When we end this service here in a little bit, if you're visiting with us, you'll see everybody's not out of the door in the next two and a half minutes. We hang around and talk to each other. We spend time fellowshipping with each other. There were some 15 or 16 or 17 ladies here at the building yesterday who just had a great time killing each other. I, no, they, they killed somebody because it was a murder mystery drama play kind of thing, okay? And I think Laura ended up dead, didn't you, Laura? Were you the she dead person? Great. Okay. Cheryl killed, <laughs> Cheryl, Cheryl killed her. See, so if you're visiting with us, we do have some problems that we're still working on. Um, but we're trying to, to make it all work out, all right? But we can laugh together. We can cry together. We can enjoy a meal together. We can do all kinds of stuff together. Because that's what God wants us to be doing. And he doesn't want us just seeing each other on Sunday morning. We read in Acts chapter 2, they met daily, going from house to house, doing things together, studying the word, praying, having fellowship, eating meals, doing the Lord's Supper, because they were building community. And that's what we're trying to do here, is take the community God's given us and develop it and draw it closer together so we can be a congregation of God's people, acting the way we're supposed to act. Because God, through Jesus Christ, prayed in John chapter 17 that when churches get together and do what they're supposed to do, what does the world see? They see love, which so tells them what? We're united, which tells us what? We're following Christ. We're following Christ, which tells us what? This is not a Dick Miller question. This is right out of John chapter 17. 
Jesus said, I want my disciples to be one so that the world will know that you sent me. Jesus says the one thing that will show this world that I truly am the Son of God and that I left heaven and came to this earth and died on a cross is that the people who follow me love each other. That's the sign of God's church. That's the only sign Jesus prayed for, for his church. He didn't ask for doctrinal purity. He didn't ask for a specific color of carpet. He didn't tell what time people needed to meet. He said, the only thing that I'm asking God is that my followers will be one as we are so that the world will know that you sent me. And so when God's people can't get along, when the Baptists don't talk to the Methodists and the Methodists don't talk to Christian church, Christian church doesn't work with the Presbyterians, all we're showing the world is God didn't send Jesus down here. That's what the world gets to see. Because Jesus says that's the sign that I truly came from the Father. Is that my people love each other. They get along well. And the world can see that in spite of all of our differences, and while I don't think his disciples knew at the moment what Jesus was asking for, within a few short years that group of Jewish people were being exposed to the Gentile world. And Gentiles were coming into the church. And if you know anything at all about that, you, and you've read the book of Acts, you know good and well that did not go over well. The Jews did not want to mingle with the Gentiles. They had looked down on them their whole life. For generations they had looked down on those Gentiles. They wanted nothing to do with them. And yet Jesus is praying, God, let these people love each other. Let them be one knowing good and well that the Gentiles and the Jews are going to have a hard time doing that. Some of us still have a hard time doing that. But his prayer was, be united. Love each other. Let the world see that we can get along with each other. And if we can show that love to the world, then we've got a much better chance at telling people about Jesus who left heaven, who came to this earth, died for us, so that we can spend eternity with God. But if we're bickering and fighting and scratching and angry and doing all kinds of stuff to each other, all of whom are supposed to be following this love of Jesus Christ, the world has every right in the world to look at us and say, it has nothing to do with your religion. Your religion's a bunch of bunk. Ain't no way in the world you're following the Son of God fighting the way you are. And they'd be absolutely right. When we're fighting like that, we're not following the Son of God. We're not living the way we're supposed to live. We're not letting the world see Jesus in us. That's the goal. That's the introduction to Central Christian Church. That's what we want to be. Next week, Lord willing, we'll get into what are some of the things we believe. What are some of the doctrinal biblical issues that we think are so important that we ask members here at Central Christian Church to believe this? And we'll talk about some of that and see do we agree on things? And again, if you've read this handout, if you've got one, if you're here today and you weren't here last week so you didn't get one, if you're visiting with us and you want one of these, there's some back there in the foyer by the door, pick one up, read that thing. And if you read through it and say, you know, here on page three it says we believe this, I don't believe that. Come talk to one of us. Let's talk about it. Because we believe the things that Central Christian Church teaches are things that the Bible says we need to believe are true. And so we'll talk about some of those next week. Thank you for being here this morning. I hope my history lesson wasn't too boring to some of you. But I think sometimes it's important to know how did we get to be who we are. And for some of you, that little building up above the railroad track called the Parsons Table, I don't even think it's got a name now. It used to be called the Parsons Table. That was the first Christian church in Jonesboro. That's where the church met many, many, many years ago. This church was purchased by the Christian church after the Presbyterians merged back together and they had this extra building. Christian church bought this building in, I think, 1942, if I remember my history correctly. And this church has been here ever since. That's how Central got to be where we are today. So if you have someone who wants to know, what is Central Christian Church? You can give them a real short history lesson of how we got to be where we are today. Let's pray. 
God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending Jesus to this world so that you, through him, could bring us salvation. Thank you, God, for exposing us to the truth, for allowing us to study together, to study your word, to be led by your spirit. And Father, so many people in this room have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And God, for that, we are so thankful. And I pray that you will continue to use Central Christian Church, that as we move forward from today, God, that we would be the kind of people that would let your love shine through us. And that when people come to us and ask us questions, God, that we would be patient and understanding and, and just share the love you put on our hearts. Help us to study our Bibles. Help us to know what your word says so that we're teaching and living the truth. God, thank you for all of this. Thank you for being the God that you are. And we give you the praise and glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Historically, we offer an invitation at this moment. John's up here, and John will take your responses. If you've got some prayer requests, you've got some praises, you've got things going on in your life that you'd like us here at Central Christian Church to pray with you about, we would be more than happy to do that. We're here as long as you want us to be here. If we don't shut the doors at 12 and everybody go home, if we need to pray and speak and carry on, whatever we need to do, we'll do it. So we're going to sing this invitation song, and if you'd like to come forward and share a praise, a prayer request, just some information, something you'd like the church to know. Uh, feel free to do that. If you don't feel comfortable coming forward, again, that's not a biblical command. There's nothing in the Bible about coming forward in church. There are some cards in the pews there in front of you. Fill one of those out. Drop them in the collection bas basket there in the back on your way out if you want to. We'll get those. We'll still pray for those. We'll still talk about them. We'll still do whatever we can do to help you with whatever your situation might be. If you've got anything you'd like to share with us, come forward and share it as we stand and sing.
Sure, we'll turn that down on number three. That is really hot. Nothing online? We'll deal with a little knocking there. Uh, yeah, I know, right? Turn the tent up a little bit, George. Is that the coldness in here making your bones creak? Uh, we had a couple come forward. Uh, Mary Lou has asked that we would pray over Dennis. He's having back surgery on Tuesday. So the eldership's going to pray over him and know him with oil uh, after I get done praying. Um, we had a couple others come forward as well. We'll pray through these real quick as Bob goes gets the oil to anoint Dennis with. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the history of the church. We thank you for forming it as you did through Christ, God. And I, and I thank you that we here at Central do our very best with your guidance to do what the Bible says. God. We don't try to impose man-made rules. We try to live as you ask us to live, God. And, and I thank you for that. Lord, I pray for Jim. Rachel's grandfather, Lord, as, as he's in hospice and dealing with cancer, God, and I just pray that you will uh, be with him. I pray you will comfort him. Be with Kelly, Rachel's mom. Be with Daniel and Rachel as well. Uh, just give them compassion and peace and comfort, Lord, during that time. And Lord, I pray for the nurses, the hospice nurses that are taking care of Jim. I pray that uh, they just do everything they can to make him peaceful, Lord. Lord, I think of uh, Caleb and Taylor, Daniel's brother and sister-in-law as well, God. Lord, I just pray you'll be with them. Cover them with peace, God, I pray. I pray they're seeking out to you for support, for comfort, God. Uh, be with Taylor as she's still in the hospital, Lord. I pray you be with the, uh, the little baby that's inside of her, God. I pray the doctors and nurses are seeking your wisdom to give, uh, to get guidance to, to help uh, Taylor deliver this baby, Lord. We pray for Martha as well, Heather's grandmother, as she's back in the hospital again. Well, this is like the third time in the month, and they're not finding out answers that they, that they need to, and I just pray you'll nudge the doctors to get some kind of uh, answers for us to what's causing their problems, God. I pray they're seeking your wisdom as they treat each, indiv each individual patient they see daily. Lord, we pray for our children and youth. As well, God, as they're going back to school, some have already started, some are going back next week, and I pray that you'll protect them. I pray you'll give each child in each class the sense of respect to the teachers, to the administration, to the other kids in the class, God. There's so much bullying going on, so much hatred sometimes in kids, and Lord, it, it's not genes, it's not born with that, it's been taught. And God, help us teach our kids, our youth, to love each other to be respectful, to be respectful to the teachers. And I pray for the teachers that are, are in the schools, Lord. And Lord, they are so important in a, in a child's life, and I just pray you'll bless them. I pray you protect them. I pray you go before them and, and set the, the stage of a, a wonderful year, Lord. I pray that they will reach out to you for, for help when needed, God, for support. And I pray that for our Sunday school teachers. I pray that for our children's church teachers. I pray that for the nursery workers, Lord that you will help them teach our kids the biblical truth. Lord, I pray for Susie and pray for Ross and Lord, as they're still mourning deaths in their life, I pray you will continue to work through them. Lord, help us not let them slide away and forget of what they're going through, God. Help us be there. Help us be the church for them that they need right now to support and bring uh, encouragement to them, Lord. Lord, I pray for John as he's going to the Navy as well. Lord, he's in boot camp. We've not heard anything back from him yet. Uh, God, I just pray that he's doing well. I pray you keep him safe. I pray you keep him strong. I pray he's drawing to you closer each and every day while he's there, Lord. Lord, Rachel's not feeling well this morning. I pray that it's nothing serious. Protect her, I pray, God. And, and, and I pray you'll just remove the sickness from her. Lord, Pauline gets praise on her surgery. It wasn't as bad as she thought it was going to be. And the doctor said it was a very mild tear. And I thank you for the doctors that are taking care of her and the nurses, Lord, and she's back home recovering. 
continue to be with her, I pray. I thank you for that she's able to worship online with us week after week. Uh, thank you for that ability that we're able to do that. Donnie comes forward with a couple requests, Lord, and uh, he's asking uh, prayers for Rhonda's brother, Larry, as he travels home in a couple of days, Lord. Uh, just be with him, I pray. Uh, protect him as he goes back to where he, uh, to his house, Lord. And thank you for the time we've had up here. Thank you for Rhonda uh, being able to see her brother as well, Lord. Lord, I do pray for Dennis. And I pray that uh, as we're preparing to anoint him with oil, Lord, I pray that you will work through him, God. I pray you work through the doctors that are, are going to be doing the surgery on his back. God. He's been in pain for so long, and I just pray this will be a, an answered prayer uh, to the prayers we've been offering up, Lord. We thank you for the for the, for the ability to the doctors have to be able to do these type of surgeries and treatments, God, and I just thank you for that. I thank you for everything you do for us. I thank you for the opportunity that you bring each and every day for us to worship you freely, God. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're, the eldership will come in, up front and we'll ask Dennis to come up front as well if he's able. And we will <coughs> pray over him and anoint him with oil. You get the seat. Okay. It is okay you if you're here. One of the things the Bible teaches in James chapter 5 says, If anyone's ill, let them call for the elders of the church who will anoint them with oil and pray over them. We claim that passage. We ask God through these prayers and to us being obedient to him, that God will do what he believes is best. So we're going to anoint Dennis with oil. We're going to pray over him. He's got back surgery this Tuesday. Most of you know he's been in pain for quite a while. He's had some surgeries already that didn't quite accomplish all the stuff they wanted. And so he's going to have some more surgery this Tuesday. And he's asked that we would pray with him. So we're going to do that. Much more extensive surgery. Much more extensive this time than before. Okay, so they're putting rods in his back and doing all kinds of things, trying to put him back together, be the tin man or something by the time he's done. <laughs> Dennis, we anoint you with oil. As the Bible says in James chapter 5, and we call upon God to be with you this Tuesday, praying, Father, that as he goes through this surgical procedure, that you will be with him, that you will help him. You'll be with the doctors, you'll be with the medical staff as they're dealing with him. God, that you'll be with Mary Lou as she's going to be there waiting and, and hoping for the best. And Father, we just believe that through your power and strength, you have the ability to pull Dennis through this and to get him out of there and to have him much better off than he was after that surgery is over. God, we're thankful that you've given surgeons the skills that they have today so that they can do some of these procedures. But God, we still rely on you. We thank you for your blessing, for your power, as you work through this procedure. And we claim the promise of James chapter 5, that you'll be with Dennis, that you'll help him go through this, trusting in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you would be with Dennis, that he's, uh, he comes in faith. He put his trust in you, Lord, and, and he's asked the elders to pray for him, and God, we do that. We lift him up and ask that you would you would touch his body, that you would go before him, Lord, and that you would be with the, the, the doctors and uh, all of the surgeons, the anesthesiologists, the nurses, the, the entire staff at, at the hospital that's doing this. And, and God, be with them and, and guide their hands, Lord. I pray, Father, that this would be the surgery that, that, that takes his pain away he's he's been in pain for a lot of years now he he, he has a smile on his face uh, and uh, sometimes he doesn't come to church because the pain is so bad and and he can't do the things that he wants to do Lord he wants to be here and he wants to fellowship with us but he, he can't Lord and, and so God we ask that you would just touch him and heal him that you would uh, just give him his strength back Lord that you would give him his coordination that you would give him a life that, that is without pain, Father. God, that, 
God, we just ask that uh, you would do this in the name of your, your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I lift this up to you. I ask that you would pour your healing down on him. Lord, help be with the doctor, be with the, however you choose to heal him, Lord. I, I pray that you would pour that out on him. Lord, I ask that you would pour out your strength on him so that he can get through this. He will have the, the ability to, to go through it no matter the suffering, Lord. I pray for your peace. God, we thank you. We thank you for the ability that we can approach you with this request, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would just touch Dennis right now. And I pray that you would remove the pain that he wouldn't need surgery, Lord, because we know you're able. We read so many times through the gospels and the miracles. You just you heal the blind, you hear the the mute, you heal the lame, you heal the one that's been paralyzed, Lord, and we ask you to heal Dennis today. And Lord, if that's not your will, I pray through this surgery the doctors that you work through them that you will heal him that way Lord Lord we trust you we know you love Dennis and we know Dennis loves you and, we, and he wants to be here more often he wants to be able to do things as Bob mentioned that he can't do right now but he's such so much pain Lord and I just pray that you would remove this pain from him remove it either through your miraculous healing or through the doctor's surgery that's coming up Lord and I thank you for him being able to get in quickly for a surgery, Lord. Some surgeries are posted, pushed out so far right now, and, and Dennis is getting in, and I thank you for that. I pray you'll be with the surgeon, the nurses, the staff that are going to be performing this, and I pray they're seeking your wisdom already right now. Lord, I pray for Mary Lou, Lord. I pray that, I, I know she's nervous, I know she's concerned, I know she's worried, Lord. Bring a peace over her that's above all understanding, God. Help us be there for Dennis and Mary. We often always pray for the person getting surgery, but Lord, there's always a significant other one beside them, concerned and worried, God. Help us be there for both of them, Lord. Be with both of them, I pray. I pray you go in that surgical room prior to the doctors and set the stage and prepare for Dennis to be healed, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you for everything he's done for us. We thank you for the power that he brings to us. <coughs> I pray this in your son's name. Father God, I echo the, the, the prayers of these previous elders. I, I pray for peace for both Mary Lou and Dennis. Bring them the peace to, to get through everyday life, to do the things that they, they've not been able to enjoy. Bring joy back into their lives and, and bring the peace of being be with the hospital.
Sunday we use our communion here at the Central Christian Church, and if you're a believer, we ask that you would, uh, that you would join us. What we do is we come down the middle aisle, and we take <coughs> the, uh, the, the cup, there's one cup with, uh, uh, on the bottom there's a, a wafer, on top there's uh, the juice. We have uh, gluten-free and a little basket in the middle, so if you will, at this time, and then 
last night that Jesus spent with his disciples. They were in what they call the upper room, and uh, they had a meal together. And at some point during that meal, uh, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and he, he gave thanks, and he blessed it, and, and uh, he, he broke it and passed it among them and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. In the same way, during that meal, Jesus took a cup. It, was, it had wine in it. We used juice. Uh, he took the cup and blessed it and said, This is the blood of the new covenant given for you. Take and drink this in remembrance of me. Thank you for being with us today. Again, read that pamphlet you've got. If you've got questions about it, get a hold of one of us and we'll try to explain it to you. Uh, have a great week. A couple of more things to share. Uh, I love the words of that song, My Sin Was Great, His Love Was Greater. And it still is. There's not a thing you can do that will separate you from the love of God. If you're claiming him as your savior, not a thing you've done in your past will God look at and think, oh, that's too much. Can't do that one. His blood covers all of our sin. Keep the faith. Don't give up. Trust in Jesus. The years go by faster and faster and faster, don't they, Cheryl? <laughs> Today is Cheryl's birthday. So maestro, if you would. blessing to somebody. Walk around with a smile on your face and when people wonder why you're smiling, I ask you, tell them because I have a Savior who loves me. And maybe they'll want to hear about that too. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for all the blessings you give us. Thank you, Father, for this time we've had together as part of your people. We pray that as we leave this building today that we leave knowing that you are our God and that we need to share the good news that we have with people we encounter. God, give us the boldness to do that. Help us to live lives that would allow people to see Christ in us. Be with Dennis on Tuesday, we pray. God, help that surgery do what he hopes it will. We praise you for that as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed, church. <laughs>